Given how much of Disney's recent output has been about Disney, meaning the proliferation of meta references. If you wear a dress and you have an animal sidekick, you're a princess. Do you have daddy issues? I don't even have a mom. Neither do we. And live action remakes made in part to address criticisms of Disney. It was probably only a matter of time before the company would go full bore and just make a Disney movie that is explicitly about Disney, but like even more than Enchanted is. How does she know you love her? Oh, no, don't. And with the company's centenary in 2023 and CEO Bob Iger's departure and return coinciding with a post-COVID run of less than stellar box office performances, and let's just say internal tensions, this would seem as good a moment as any to remind audiences of the Disney magic and in effect press the big reset button. And so here we are with Wish, an animated movie which is all at once a celebration of Disney, a manifesto for Disney's future, a meta commentary on Disney and Disney's place in popular culture, and a Disney origin story. But not just, because the more you watch it, the more certain ideas present themselves. And it's just about impossible not to feel that these ideas are in deep and heated conversation with the current situation over at the Mouse House, given a very recent and very public fallout between the company's higher management and its employees, and given the disparity between the company's public face and its behind the scenes tensions. To wit, it's hard not to see Wish as both a very public cry for help and a call to arms from an employee group that's always been pretty good at subtle euphemistic messaging. That's what I do. And so here that ability to hide a message in plain sight has reached its apotheosis because once you've noticed it, it's just about impossible not to conclude that Wish's villain Magnifico is really either Bob Iger or former CEO Bob Chapek, or just Disney's entire top management, for which I guess the public face of corporate Disney seems the main spokesman and focus. Wish's storybook opening signals that this is to be in many ways a callback to traditional animated Disney, given that the storybook opening was for many years a Disney staple. But Wish's storybook doesn't put in most of the salient and important background information regarding its villain's motivations. Only obliquely referenced is the fact that the whole Wish obsession thing's origins lay in the destruction of the guy's hometown by thieves. But then that's because it doesn't really matter. What's important is that you understand the guy's whole deal is wishes, as in he's like totally obsessed with wishes and learns magic just so he can protect wishes. But crucially, he's not really into granting wishes. He just, uh, he just wants to keep them in little magical spheres forever and possess them, which is the real thematic point of the thing. And having developed the hyper-specific and very singular ability to keep wishes in little spheres, he rebrands himself Magnifico and sets off to establish what's really just Disneyland, but in universes called Rosas, an island on which people can come and live for free. And the only thing Magnifico asks is that you turn in your most cherished wish to him for protection. And But the caveat is that you forget your wish when you turn it in until Magnifico grants it, which he might, but probably won't, in one of the theatrical ceremonies the inhabitants all trot out for monthly in the hopes that their wish might be picked. Sometime later we meet our protagonist Asha, who this morning is preparing for an interview to be Sorcerer's Apprentice. And en route to the castle she stops to do a musical tour of the island, which musical interlude has fast become Disney's established shorthand for laying the scene, appearing in Moana and Encanto to name just two off the top of the old dome. And then she's off to the castle to meet her seven dwarf adjacent friends, who do nothing but bake cookies of Magnifico's head. And though it's kind of skipped over, the film's explicit about the fact that batches of these cookies get sent to Magnifico. Cookies. Cookies. No, this batch is for the king. Uh. 
and that Magnifico is apparently eating batches of cookies in the shape of his own head. And now consider that the bakers are Castle employees, Magnifico retains an entire staff just to keep him in supply of Magnifico head-shaped cookies, which just try and imagine the type of guy who would do this. Asha makes small talk with Queen Amaya as they ascend the stairs to Magnifico's study, where we're introduced to the man himself. Asha makes a dork of herself by activating the magic charm protecting Magnifico's book of forbidden magic that he has for reasons, meaning it's never explained just what the book is or why he has it beyond some vague Disney hand waving and you have to assume it's because the book itself is not really important, it's just going to be an easy way to turn Magnifico insanely evil once the plot requires him to turn insanely evil. Asha recovers her composure and she charms Magnifico with her love for roses and for wishes. And as they bond over their respective childhood traumas, he decides to take it to his fiercely and magically protected wish room, where they sing a duet about protecting the wishes. As they sing, we get to see some of the wishes, which you're struck by how modest and humble most of the wishes are. Like, yeah, this one woman wants to fly, but this guy just wants to start a family. Uh, this other guy just wants to be, like, really buff. And But the point is that these are, by and large, not unattainable as far as wishes go. Like, we're a long way from the Make Me a Prince wish fulfillment of Aladdin, so what you get is a sense that the citizens could just learn to play an instrument, or take a course in sewing, or hit the gym, but that instead they've been swayed by the promise of protection and sanctuary into handing their dreams over to this one guy. And now this one guy decides which get granted. And speaking of, in the middle of the duet, Asha sees her grandfather's wish, which turns out to be just a really humble desire to inspire the younger generations of Roses through music. She shows the wish to Magnifico, and he gets a little defensive because apparently there's this whole unspoken tradition in which every new apprentice gets like a wish or two granted as a little favour. And Asha's mortified because she thinks that Magnifico thinks that she's angling for a little gift, but Magnifico's cool about it until he looks at the wish because he deems it too dangerous to grant. Because in his logic, what if the music inspires the younger generations to rise up or rebel and overthrow him or even destroy Roses? So Asha asks why he can't just give the wishes back if he's not going to grant them, to which Magnifico explains that only he decides what does and does not get granted because only he can decide what's good for Roses. From which you can infer that the guy does not trust or like or respect his subjects one bit. And so the whole atmosphere gets tense and fraught because Asha understands that this guy's whole deal is not protection, but control. Plus the way he flies off the handle at just the thought of giving wishes back does not bode well. But then it's time for the big ceremony, which is like a whole monthly ritual where Magnifico accepts the wishes of his citizens on their 18th birthdays and then grants exactly one wish. And while Asha sits processing what's just happened, he makes a big show of saying how he's been challenged by Asha into doing something new, which turns out to be both a fake out and a cop out because he does not grant the grandfather's wish, but a different, totally non threatening wish, which the public just about goes gaga for. And as he leaves the stage, he tells Asha that he will not be hiring her, then walks smugly back into the castle while Asha sits whiplashed and totally stunned. And so it's here in this passage that the comparisons between Magnifico and Iger both present themselves and become undeniable. And granted, the comparison is not immediately obvious. It takes a little time to get there because Magnifico is impossibly quaffed and handsome and charismatic and voiced by famously handsome actor Chris Pine. And Bob Iger is Bob Iger. But their positions at the top of their respective food chains and their attitudes towards and decisions in those positions is undeniably similar, given that Wish is a Disney movie about Disney and that the wishes are pretty explicitly meant to be Disney dreams. Fantasy land in the sky, huh? How about Neverland? <laughs> And out here in the real world, Aiga owns the real Disney dreams, and the final decision about which dreams get granted is his. And so Magnifico sees it as his responsibility to grant 
only the wishes that are good for Rosas, which we understand to mean what's good for Magnifico and what maintains the utopian image of Rosas, and which by extension means keeping the population of the island docile and compliant and non-questioning. Um, but he pretends to himself that he has to do this because the people of Rosas can't realise their own dreams and they need a powerful benevolent benefactor to whom they should just be grateful. People come here because they know they can't make their own dreams come true. The journey is too hard, it is too unfair. And, but it never once occurs to him that he like doesn't actually have to do this. Suffice to say that from all of this it's basically impossible not to infer that the people of Rosas represent Disney's employees. Since those employees create and maintain the Disney dreams, and those dreams are required to go straight to Bob Iger for Iger's discernment and approval, which approval we don't have to imagine is probably less than forthcoming. Like, you can imagine how many Disney ideas get stamped with a big Mickey Mouse shaped copyright stamp and then locked permanently away in the big filing cabinet up in the man's own personal office before he puts his signature on like Frozen 7 or whatever. Which is to say that you can't get past the feeling that Magnifico really is a Disney employee's impression of Bob Iger and Iger's bland corporate effectiveness and his attitude towards creativity and creative people, because get this. Asha shows Magnifico a modest little animated drawing she's made, to which Magnifico visibly flinches in confusion and discomfort before he recovers enough to wonder aloud. Talent? Do we call that a talent? No. <laughs> I mean, this stuff is just not remotely subtle. So after this whole sorry sequence of events, Asha returns home and sulks about why it's unfair that one powerful man has control of all the island's wishes. And in doing so, she upsets her grandfather, who just does not want to remember what his wish is, given that the old guy is 100 years old and has given up on ever getting the wish granted. So like, what's even the point in knowing? So Asha goes out to sing about it, and she comes across the patch of forest and the tree where her father used to take her, and which it's impossible not to see the father as Uncle Walt coded, because the father's the one who taught Asha to draw, and his whole thing is that he was all about looking outward in awe and wonder, and allowing yourself to uncynically dream, and he's basically placed in direct opposition to Magnifico. And so Asha makes a wish upon a star, and she calls on the spirit of Uncle Walt to come down and rid Rosas, meaning Disney, of Magnifico's, meaning Iger's, corrupting influence, meaning control of Disney's intellectual property. And wishing on a star does indeed conjure the spirit of Uncle Walt and the magic of Disney in the form of the star from Disney's animated logo, which casts a bright light across the island, and over in the castle, Magnifico freaks out because someone out there is doing external, non-Disney sanctioned magic, and external magic is a threat to Rosas, for which read Disney's profits. And the star comes down and demonstrates the power of Disney magic by causing all the animals and plants to talk. And they all sing a song about magic, and about embracing the magic, and why you shouldn't think too hard about the magic specifically, or fairy tales in general, and that you definitely shouldn't try to logic the animated fairy tale Dream Factory. If you're trying to figure out just who you are, don't look far. All of which feels very deliberately aimed at a certain class of people who do indeed try to logic the Disney fairy tale movies. We know they had to have at some point, or why else? Why would there be a full castle complete with servants and a prince on their doorstep? And that makes us wonder how no one noticed that the entire royal family, including its servants, apparently vanished into thin air. And who Disney's current crop of live action remakes are constantly addressing. As days bled into years, the prince and his servants were forgotten by the world. For the enchantress had erased all memory of them from the minds of the people they loved. And in short, there is a lot going on. But there's even more going on than that, because it's about the time the bisexual lightning kicks in that you realise the song is called I'm a star. And that a very diverse cast of animals are singing euphemistic lyrics about figuring out who you are, and about how we're all made of the same stuff, and that we are all our own origin stories, and that no matter who you are,
And now but remember that Wish comes out in 2023 and that this is only a year after a very public fallout in which Disney first refused to denounce Florida's Don't Say Gay bill until employee pressure and walkouts forced then CEO Bob Chapek to backtrack in the weakest and most token of fashions. And remember that Chapek's response in turn prompted an open and very public letter from a diverse workforce about their disappointment in Disney management given that Disney pushes an LGBTQ friendly agenda, yet continues to force its animators and employees to make Disney products less gay, which just get a load of the open letter Disney Pixar employees put out in 2022 in response. We at Pixar have personally witnessed beautiful stories full of diverse characters come back from Disney corporate reviews shaved down to crumbs of what they once were. Nearly every moment of overtly gay affection is cut at Disney's behest, regardless of when there is protest from both the creative teams and executive leadership at Pixar. Suffice to say that the gays have come to be seen as a threat to Disney's financial bottom line, which fact has become particularly fraught and only more relevant in the aftermath of 2022's Lightyear, which film featured a same-sex kiss that was initially removed under pressure from Disney management, but was then restored to the edit after the Don't Say Gay Bill fiasco and subsequent fallout. And But the kiss is still seen amongst Disney's top hierarchy to have tanked the film financially due to its being banned in over 14 countries. And apparently the whole thing remains a bone of contention and source of tension and friction since the fallout from the whole episode is still, and perhaps even more pervasively, forcing creative teams to tone down the gay stuff for fear of a repeat performance. See for just the most recent example, this year's Inside Out 2. And so it's not hard to see that these events accelerated Chapek's departure and Iger's return, given that Iger's corporate blandness makes him seem as something of a steady hand. But regardless of the public resolution, there are clearly still internal tensions and resentments, and you can just imagine how hostile and fraught the whole company environment is, given that Disney creative teams are writing queer-affirming and metaphor-laden anthems into the Disney centenary celebration movie. And get this, because even though I'm a star is already just wild as a Disney song, there's still room to get in a dig at Iger's and Disney's corporate mindset and influence in Floridian politics, such influence allegedly including $3 million donations to anti-LGBTQ legislators, because the animals all come together to sing When it comes to the universe, we're all shareholders Get back for your system! Solar! So Asha is inspired by the star to go back in and up to Magnifico's study and break her family's wishes out. So she hotfoots it back to the castle, where the star and Valentino, Asha's sidekick goat, get into an involved bit where they cause all sorts of trouble. And eventually there's a whole song and dance routine involving chickens. This bit is good. It's a, it's a fun bit. I like this bit. And with the help of her friends, Asha sets out a plan to distract Magnifico while she takes the dumbwaiter up to the study, but the star immediately undermines the whole thing and sets off a fire because it just will not be restrained and like just cannot help but be totally and optimally and magically whimsical at all times. And so Asha only just has time to grab her grandfather's wish before Magnifico comes back to the castle. About which? So the distraction involves keeping Magnifico away from the study by keeping him engaged in a series of questions about the magic, which questions eventually just break the man psychologically because he's really Bob Iger and the people of Roses are Disney's employees, and Bob Iger clearly has no time for what he sees as the ingratitude of his employees, and he clearly resents having to answer in any way to his employees. And so Magnifico storms back to the castle and sings the world's most upbeat song about how ungrateful and demanding everybody is and how they don't deserve him. And this is the thanks I get. And therefore about how incredible he, Magnifico, thinks Magnifico is. You're 
so brilliant. Oh, that's the least you could say. Which makes the whole representation of Iga as a handsome, charismatic sorcerer make sense, because you realise that this is probably how Disney's employees think that Iga sees himself. Also, at one point he sings about granting 14 wishes the previous year, and 14 happens to be the number of theatrical releases Disney put out in 2022 to 2023 leading up to Wish, and so this ties the whole public ceremony thing together in terms of Magnifico's promises and extravagant public performance versus the actual fulfilment of only the most non-threatening wishes which in short has undeniable parallels with Disney's theatrical releases and marketing campaigns because such campaigns promise great and diverse and unique things but deliver like So at this point, Asha just about gets out undetected because Magnifico's too busy going nuclear and breaking out the forbidden book, which at this point you get the impression that like everything else in this movie, it has to be metaphorical, but must be in a way that it's obviously intensely personal to Disney employees and impenetrably obtuse to everybody else. Regardless, it turns him immediately insanely evil, but like more than he already was. So why the book is probably a metaphor is that it's not clear what the forbidden magic is supposed to do, because right now Magnifico is only thinking about finding the external magic, and it's not clear how the forbidden magic's going to help him do that, since what eventually does for Arsha and the star is not the magic, but Simon's betrayal of Arsha in return for having his wish fulfilled. But again, I guess none of this matters because, again, Magnifico is Bob Iger, and his actions and impulses are Iger's, and basically you can see that nobody involved in making this thing really cares about the internal logic because they're more concerned with giving Iger one giant metaphorical middle finger. So yes, Simon tells Magnifico that Arsha is the traitor, and Magnifico confronts Arsha and makes a point of how evil he is by smashing and absorbing Arsha's mother's wish, which in another totally non-subtle metaphor it turns out that smashing and destroying wishes makes Magnifico stroke Aiga more evil and more powerful, and there's a moment in which it's revealed that the loss of a wish is equal to death and grief. My heart knows this feeling. This is grief which you have to wonder just how many very personal Disney ideas and stories and plots Iger has personally nixed out of the corporate imperative for everything to have billion dollar potential. You were never going to grant my Saba's wish and he deserves to have it back. They all deserve. I told you, I decide what they deserve. The star distracts Magnifico long enough for Asha, her mother and grandfather to escape on horseback and then boarded across the lake but Arsha feels both guilty and responsible for how things have gone down, so she determines to go back and free the wishes, and she leaves her family and goes back to land with the star and Valentino. Meanwhile, Magnifico makes a powerful staff using the forbidden magic, which who knows what the metaphor there is. Arsha returns to the castle just as Magnifico is putting on a big show of framing Arsha as a traitor, and he reveals Simon to be the one who turned in Arsha, for which Simon has granted his heart's desire to be Magnifico's most loyal knight. Which, take a moment to think of all the union-coded implications implicit in turning someone in for personal favour with the top brass, meaning Simon's a scab. And so Simon decides that, while well, he's all in at this point, so he names the rest of his friends as collaborators. And off to the side, Queen Amira makes a sad face because it occurs to her that she's married to Bob Iger. And well, Iger's evilness is getting hard to deny. Frankly, the staff and the forbidden magic are a bit ominous and not at all good signs. And as she's making the sad face, a little mouse comes up with a message from Asha to like, basically turn traitor and overthrow Magnifico to which the sad face becomes a thoughtful face, because the forbidden magic really is not looking good. The whole group of outcasts flees the scene, and they meet up in a sanctuary where they all sing a song about overthrowing the king, which song is called Knowing What I Know Now, and is just absolutely union coded because it has lyrics like If we don't fight, he knows he wins. And I don't think he's prepared for what's coming. 
and basically the whole thing is just so obviously about the fallout of the public letter and the Disney walkouts and union action and it feels basically like a declaration of war against the Disney hierarchy And during the song, Queen Amira turns up and she's like, well, my husband's evil now, so I guess we should kill him. And she gets right in there with the rest of them and sings about revolution like she's been waiting a long time for just this moment. About which, you have to wonder what this all says about Boba Iger's real wife, the improbably named Willow Bay, given that the original story saw Magnifico and the Queen as a sort of evil power couple until the plot was scaled back and she became a sort of benevolent good leader, to which the mind can only boggle. So the plan, as much as there is one, is for Asha to lure Magnifico into the woods and away from the castle while the others break in and release the wishes by opening the castle roof. And if it feels like this is the same plan as before, it's because it essentially is. Because nobody working on this project seems to really care about the plot because it doesn't really feel like they've been given any incentive or reason to care about the plot. But it turns out that Magnifico saw the whole thing coming, and it's not Magnifico out there in the woods, but a magically disguised scab in the form of Simon. So Arsha restrains Simon with the help of her unionised animal friends, and a wand which she has now, for reasons, and she hotfoots it back to the castle, but is just a little bit too late. And back at the castle, Magnifico restrains the gang and the wishes with his evil green magic. And then he restrains the citizenry of Roses, and finally Asha, who he brings up to the roof while he monologues about being evil, and about how his newfound ability to crush wishes into himself and absorb them has made him more powerful than ever. Which at this point, it's not only not subtle, but has somehow gone all the way around to being anti-subtle. And as he does all this, he absorbs the Disney star into the staff. He literally traps and nullifies all the Disney magic. And his eyes are green and he's just totally crazy and way past any reason. But then, just when hope seems lost, Asha realises that the only way to beat Magnifico is through the power of dreams and communal unionised action and real Disney magic. And she inspires the whole of Roses to rise up and sing an inspirational song about making a wish and making a stand. The communal power of which defeats Magnifico and traps him in the staff. And it releases the wishes and the star and the citizens of Roses. And it's not hard to see this as the call to action it is. Because the citizens of Roses all get their wishes back. And they all agree that leaving the power to grant wishes in the hands of one powerful and blandly corporate man with no imagination and total devotion to the bottom line is maybe not the recipe for dreams or creativity to flourish. Is in fact a bastardisation of everything Roses is supposed to stand for. And so now the guy's out of the way, they can maybe work together and realise those dreams for themselves. And because somewhere in all of this which is also an origin story, defeating Magnifico basically frees all of Disney's stories. And so Peter Pan and Wendy go off together to learn how to fly, Asha becomes the fairy godmother of Cinderella, and it's not hard to see all of this as the potential of a Disney freed from corporate imperatives, a Disney allowed to dream and imagine and play. So what we're left with is a film that announces itself as a celebration of Disney. And in many ways it is a celebration of Disney. But that's the Disney of Uncle Walt and not Uncle Bob. And let's be clear about Uncle Walt, the man was hardly a saint and there are very real and valid criticisms of both him and the studio under his stewardship. But regardless, his vision of Disney was aspirational and heartfelt. His love of animation and dreams and stories and fairy tales felt genuine even if he was a good corporate man. And in the popular imagination, he stands in like total contrast to Iger, under who Disney is absolutely and only about the money. Modern Disney is a corporate machine, one of the best corporate machines that has ever existed. Its products calibrated for maximum financial potential. And all of this doesn't really leave room for diverse and interesting stories. 
There is no place in modern Disney for the experiments of Dumbo's animators or the happy accident of the Lion King, which was a side project at the time of development because it clashed with Pocahontas, but was nevertheless there for anyone who wanted to work on it. Let's not even imagine trying to get the Emperor's new groove made in 2024. How did we, Kronk? Well, you got me. By all accounts, it doesn't make sense. It's hard not to see the frustrations with Disney from inside Disney in this movie. And it's basically impossible not to see the film for what it really is. A critique of Bob Iger and Bob Iger's apparent hypocrisy and megalomania and total obsession with the bottom line. But it's also a call to action for Disney's employees and audiences to step up and do something about the whole sorry situation before the Dream Factory disappears into the corporate haze of proven properties and derivative sequels forever and ever and ever. Because at time of writing, Disney's highest grossing animated films are Inside Out 2 and Frozen 2. And over the next few years, up to 2027, Disney's schedule includes sequels for Moana, Zootopia, Toy Story, and even more sequels to both The Incredibles and Frozen. And it includes the Lion King prequel, and it includes yet more live action remakes in the form of Lilo and Stitch, Moana again, and next year's Snow White. It's not yet clear if sequel fatigue is going to set in, but the smart bet would be on Disney to enjoy a renewed period of billion dollar superiority at the box office. But that period is going to be characterized by an almost total lack of imagination. It is literally sequels and prequels and remakes all the way down. And it's not clear how sustainable a renaissance that is going to be in the long run. We are a long way from the Disney renaissance of the 1990s, which renaissance saw some of Disney's most popular and enduring original properties in The Lion King and The Little Mermaid and Aladdin and Beauty and the Beast. And in all of this, just imagine what Disney's employees, both internally and publicly advocating for more representation, but seeing their original ideas and stories and diversity get crushed into Bob Iger's metaphorical evil staff and either destroyed or smoothed into totally non-offensive and blandly safe products must be making of it all as they animate another popular property for like the seventh time. Wait a second. There's something off. Something I keep coming back to. Because in this whole metaphor of a movie, who is Queen Amira? What, or rather, who does she represent? Because it doesn't make sense for her to just be Bob Iger's wife, certainly not in the way the plot was scaled down to turn her from villain to good guy, and certainly not in the fact that, as far as anyone knows, Willow Bay does not have any personal influence or financial stake in Disney. And the more I think about it, the more I wonder about the timing of the whole movie. Because Wish came out in 2023, which means Bob Iger had only just gotten his feet back under the CEO table after Bob Chapek was booted from the company in November 2022, given that this was only two months after Wish had officially entered development. And of course, Chapek's reign was characterised by a very public fallout and let's just say tense relationship with his employees. And it was in short a frantic and chaotic and troubling reign, which coincided with a string of uninspiring and less than stellar box office performances. But what does this all remind you of? And so, but Iger was brought back because he seemed to be a steady hand. His inoffensive and corporate blandness inspiring calm and calm boring corporate blandness was just what the doctor ordered. And though at time of speaking, it looks like that calm is already falling apart, which was written and developed towards the end of Chapex reign. and it predates a lot of the internal problems Disney is currently grappling with. Like Iger delving through the Disney accounts and decreeing that it is going to be nothing but sequels all the way down. 
and Iger's anti-union comments on the writers' strike, in which he euphemistically described strikers as disruptive forces preying on the business, and his firing of 14% of the Pixar workforce just this year, which saw horrendous working conditions during the making of Inside Out 2, and saw fired staff miss out on bonuses despite working so hard to make the film the unmitigated financial success Disney needed it to be. Which feels at least in part a warning from Iger to be careful what you wish for in the aftermath of the writer's strike. And none of this is even to mention the continued insistence on scaling back the gay stuff because we're still obsessively worried that like Egypt's gonna ban The Incredibles 3 or something. And so, but what if the timing of the thing means that Magnifico is not Bob Iger, but Bob Chapek? Did I get the wrong Bob? Because this would make Queen Amira make sense. Queen Amira is not exactly the power behind Magnifico's throne, but a steadying, grounding influence. And Iger was a steadying, grounding influence when he stepped down but kept an executive role to ease the company's transition. And so this suggests some troubling parallels. Because while Amira keeps Magnifico steady to a point, she can't stop him when he goes fully off the deep end and breaks open the forbidden book. And while Iger evidently held Chapek steady to a point, he could not stop Chapek when Chapek went fully off the deep end and broke out the internal memo and continually said all the wrong things. And but don't forget that Wish ends with Magnifico overthrown and imprisoned. His place on the throne taken by Queen Amira, that steadying, grounding influence who restores order and calm to the realm and makes all the right noises and decisions. And so the horrifying thought presents itself. That Wish is not a criticism of Iger, but what at the time would have felt an appropriate call for Iger's steady hand to return and right the ship. After all, Iger did make the right overtures when he tweeted his opposition to the Don't Say Gay Bill. And under Iger, Disney did at least have a history of publicly opposing anti-LGBTQ legislation, which is hard to overstate the contrast with Chapek's long silence and eventual non-committal response. In this at least, Iger has put himself on the right side of the divide, even if his subsequent actions have not backed him up. And so who wouldn't forgive a queer Disney employee, looking at their employer financing anti-gay Floridian legislators, then looking at Iger's at least publicly made support, and thinking that maybe, just maybe things were better under the last guy. And so in a very real sense, you'd be forgiven for thinking that Wish is actually not a critique of Bob Iger, but a celebration of Bob Iger and the calm, steady rudder of Iger's tenure. To which I can only say that I guess you truly should be careful what you wish for. When you get to it, the truth is probably actually somewhere in between in terms of which Bob Magnifico is supposed to represent. Because for all Iger's bland corporate ethos contrasts with Chapek's chaotic and abrasive tenure, the man never really left. Iger has always been there. He held an executive role between 2020 and 2022, and according to some sources, was the man Chapek still answered to. And he was there when the shit really started to hit the fan. And given that Wish is clearly a call to return to traditional Disney values, some of them, and reject Disney's more modern corporate values, you could conclude that Magnifico is less specifically one guy and more the general corporate culture of Disney and whichever Bob happens to embody that culture at any given time. <laughs>